Hannes. Um, I'm a senior at the University of Florida, and today we are talking about exercise induced rhabdomyolysis and prevention and how to coach. So, here's a brief outline of what I'm going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about um, the description of exercise induced rhabdomyolysis, the prevalence and importance of it, uh, prevention and care as coaches future implications, and finally opening up the discussion. So I want to talk about um, first defining exercise-induced rhabdomyolysis. So rhabdomyolysis in, in and of itself is the breakdown of skeletal muscle tissue. Um, and for exercise-induced rhab rhabdomyolysis, or EIR, it's the physiological condition of skeletal muscle damage. Um, by overexertion and uh, excessive physical activity. And this is manifested by an increase in creatine kinase or myoglobin, which seeps into the bloodstream, um, causing, uh, seeping into the bloodstream through damaged uh, cell membrane. So some symptoms to be aware about for EIR is um, dark colored urine, this is coming from uh, that seeping of myoglobin into uh, the bloodstream, going through the kidneys, and uh, causing discoloration of the urine. Severe muscle pain, weakness, soreness is very common. Uh, it's particularly different from your typical like, delayed onset of muscle soreness. Um, fatigue is another big symptom. And onset is usually one to, day, one to two days after the strenuous activity and or excessive uh, exercise. Diagnosis. Um, so a main indicator of diagnosing EIR is to evaluate your creatine kinase blood uh, levels. So uh, normal, uh, normal amounts of creatine kinase in the blood ranges from 22 to 198 units per liter. So for someone to be diagnosed with EIR, it's going to be greater than five times that normal upper limit. So let's say like a thousand, you would be diagnosed. Uh, typically in the research that I saw, it was a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand um, for these athletes that were performing these strenuous exercises. Um, myoglobinuria, sorry, I can't really pronounce that, but like I said, that was a picture that we uh, saw earlier, that dark colored, discolored urine, and that's the presence of myoglobin in the blood from your damaged cell. Skeletal muscle, uh, skeletal muscle cells. Uh, severe persistent cramps or pain, uh, different from delayed onset of muscle soreness. So going into the pathophysiology of um, describing what, what and how EIR comes about and what it uh, leads to. So it's just a little diagram, I'm gonna go over it. Uh, so, like I said, EIR is gonna be coming from that excessive, strenuous physical activity. Um, most people will be novice or beginners, and that will cause that injury. Um, that leads to sarcoma and sarcoplasmic reticulum injury in the myocytes or muscle cells. Also, that injury, sarcoma injury to the cell membrane is, um, associated with increased cellular permeability to calcium. Um, and of course, excessive physical activity is going to deplete our ATP stores needed for energy to continue on um, doing the exercise. So all of these would lead to increase in intracellular concentration of calcium, and that uh, concentration of calcium would increase the activity of calcium-dependent phospholipases proteases that catalyzes or breaks down the proteins um, in the cell membrane, or cell membrane and the sarcoplasm. Uh, that would lead to the leakage of intracellular proteins from that injury uh, that we, that has already happened. So leakage of intracellular proteins that can be creatine kinase, uh, myoglobin, calcium, uh, potassium is also another one. And then all of this would lead to um, possibly acute kidney injury. So acute kidney, kidney injury is a very big, um, very big risk factor when someone 
is diagnosed with EIR. So this can this is accounting for 10 to 30 percent of uh, all EIR cases. It can also lead to compartment syndrome. So that is um, build build up of pressure or edema in a localized part of your body. So it can be the lower back if someone's you know bed lifting or um, back squatting over and over and over, uh, high volume, high density exercise can lead to compartment syndrome um, and that would be treated with like a fasciotomy to relieve that pressure in that part of the body. Cardiac arrhythmias and blood clotting, this is another big issue that we see. So creatine kinase is also um, found in cardiac, cardiac tissue. So if we're leaking creatine kinase, we're affecting our heart as well. And, uh, another big thing or risk factor for with clotting would be um, if someone were to be diagnosed with sickle cell trait. So exertional sickling could be a big risk factor, um, increase that risk factor of mortality diagnosed with EIR. Uh, clotting from all of that leakage of intracellular proteins that lead to hypovolemia, so increased viscosity of the blood. And then, so moving on to the prevalence and importance of EIR. So in the study that I found, we talked, they talked about um, uh, presence of EIR in civilians, military, and CrossFit. Uh, obviously it can happen with anyone doing uh, exertional, extreme exertional exercise, but increasing popularity of fitness, increasing diagnosis of EIR. Uh, during recent decades, particularly the last two decades, CrossFit has skyrocketed, um, increasing popularity worldwide. So right now there's millions of people and participants that are in CrossFit, and with the recent like uh, popularity of fitness, getting more fit, the years, we're going to see higher risk of injury with exercise. So EIR in civilians, 10 times more cases of males and females, mainly because um, we typically see males more in the gym setting, more in the fitness industry. Uh, but one thing to note is that it's usually mild to moderate cases. Some will be hospitalized um, with exertional heat stroke. So one risk factor would be exercise with the heat. Uh, when you do that with extreme exercise, you're gonna have increased risk of injury and increased risk of uh, mortality. EIR in the military. This is mainly occurring during um, recruit training sessions, uh, boot camp on military installations. So with boot camp or anything like that, they're gonna be most of the recruits are gonna be novice or beginners. Um, they're young. Uh, age is another factor in EIR, so that is a big thing in the military as well. So right there, among active service members in 2018, 545 instances of exertional, uh, exertional rhabdomyolysis, uh, which is greater than 20 times more than the rate of civilian men in the study that um, in this study. EIR and CrossFit. You know, CrossFit is very focused on high intensity, repetitive exercises. Um, and that in itself would lead to higher risk of injury, higher risk of uh, developing EIR. And then in uh, the study that I found as well, EIR following CrossFit participation can occur in as little as one session. Um, because a lot of the participants uh, that develop EIR are beginners, they're novices. They're not used to the physical exertion that comes with CrossFit training. Moving on to prevention and care. So who's at risk? Like I said, children and adolescents, they're smaller in weight, they're smaller in size, they are not accustomed, they're still growing. So when you put a child or an adolescent in that, that tri type of training session that's high intensity, um, high volume, high density, you're gonna put them more at risk of um, depleting their ATP and 
at risk of developing EIR. Very intrinsically motivated athletes. I found this one to be kind of, uh, in my opinion, self-explanatory. If someone is, maybe they haven't like worked out in a while and they want to get better or join the military and they need to train. They want to train and they want to um, be as ready as possible. Uh, one study that I found was one male, he was ready to join the military and enlist, so he decided to run 16 miles. Um, obviously that didn't go well for him. It ended up with just that one run. He felt fatigue one to two days afterwards, um, got sent to the hospital or uh, uh, consulted a doctor, and then was hospitalized for over 30 days because of that. Um, it affected his kidneys, so he developed acute kidney injury that leading to kidney failure, put on to antibiotics because of risk of developing a bacterial infection. And this is a big thing, like this is real. People that are intrinsically motivated to keep going, to exercise and to push themselves might not be accustomed to the stress that they're putting onto their body. Um, so that tie into athletes going to failure with high volume. So like hell week, um, so in the military, pushing uh, boot camp, uh, maybe even punishing recruits or uh, in a different setting of members to punishing them as a way of training them. So if they didn't listen to their coach, um, the coach would give them a punishment. Uh, physically exert them, push them to exhaustion, and that can lead to EIR. Um, dehydrated athletes, hypovolemia was already a big issue with blood clotting um, and developing EIR. So if an athlete is already dehydrated, you're gonna put uh, that athlete more at risk. Training and heat, as we know, I've talked about that. Uh, it's coming back from injury and or and or semi-sedentary breaks. So if you have an athlete that's coming back um, from an off season or he has just been uh, recovering from an injury, you're not the you're not going to want to put that athlete into uh, the same training session as what you've been putting the rest of the team on. That the rest of the team has been doing strength training for so long, you don't want to put that athlete back with them. Um, but this is this has happened, especially with the NCAA, but they um, are now more regulating that with guidelines. Prevention tips for coaching and care. Um, warming up and periodic repetition of eccentric exercises. We want to make sure that our athletes or general population, their bodies are primed for the workout that they're doing, so you don't want them to just go right into it. Uh, warming up is essential, uh, especially if you're doing weight-bearing exercises, uh, weight-bearing eccentric exercises. You don't want to put that muscle at risk of tearing or strain. Uh, sufficient hydration and electrolyte replenishment, as we said, or as I've shown with the pathophysiology chart that I put on, um, you're gonna your electrolytes, so calcium, potassium, it's gonna leak out of the cells. You want to make sure that those electrolytes are in balance when you're ready to coach. Um, increase exercise intensity in a stepwise fashion to avoid injury. Like I said, warming up, making sure that you are progressing uh, adequately and appropriately, and not just not just uh, programming a training exercise to max every single time that you're um, putting an athlete through a, a session. Awareness and precaution of sickle cell trait athletes. Um, Stress-induced sickling may lead to cardiovascular tissue damage. Uh, exertional sickling paired with EIR is going to have so much more of a risk factor for mortality um, because it's affecting that heart. And I put 50%, there's a 50% higher risk of uh, developing EIR in those of African descent. So that's important to know, especially with the sports industry. A lot of the demographic there, um, they're gonna be of African American descent or African descent. Um, 
you want to make sure that you're screening your athletes properly for that tree. Treatment. If you suspect uh, an athlete or someone of having EIR, the main treatment will be intravenous um, fluid administration. And that's mainly to prevent acute kidney injury because once it affects the kidney, it can lead to organ failure. Kansas, I'm so sorry, but I got 11 o'clock. Sorry. sorry to miss this. Sorry. I'll come back to yours. So what can we do in the future? Uh, I believe that we should be continuing on educating our leaders, our coaches, sports industry members um, on the prevention of <laughs> developing EIR in athletes and uh, people looking to get back into training. And we can do this by going over proper training techniques, principles, uh, what di uh, discussing what are suitable work to rest uh, periods, and awareness of those symptoms to prevent the developing of EIR. Enforcing rules and guidelines for physical training in the military and sports organizations. Like I said, it's a big thing in the military. Um, and also the NCAA, but with the NCAA, because there has been deaths in uh, the NCAA within recent decades because of EIR, they enforce guidelines, put up standards, rules um, for that. And I, uh, in one of the papers that I have, the author discusses that the mil military should do the same because it is also existing in that kind of setting. Um, so screening for exertional signaling, for um, uh, sickling cell trait, a uh, sickle cell trait, uh, we need to do that to make sure which we know which athletes to push uh, or which athletes to take precaution for training, um, and also regulating excessive physical punishment during training sessions, making sure that you're not pushing your athletes or recruits to um, full fatigue and just basically burning them out. That's going to obviously increase the risk factor of developing rhabdomyolysis, and um, we want to make sure that we are uh, regulating that and holding those people that are doing that or implementing those um, punishments accountable. So moving on to discussion. Discussion and questions. Um, yeah, I actually have a question yeah. um, about like EIR with like African American uh, populations. Is there like a certain trait you saw that is a reason for why African Americans, you know, get EIR more, like because you yeah. said it was fifty percent. Right. Yes. With, so um, sickle cell trait is more prevalent um, in yeah. that African uh, of people of African descent. So because sickle cell trait is more prevalent in that population, they're more at risk of exertional <coughs> signaling. Um, and exertional signaling paired with uh, EIR is going to increase the rate of mortality. So in one of the papers that I reviewed or I um, used as part of my reference, uh, of the people that did die uh, of exertional, of EIR, they had exertional signaling paired with it. Um, so that was a big risk factor. Yeah. And the next one, so you talked a lot about military. And in my experience, a lot of that increased exercise is, is kind of for punishment, but it's also more of a screening tool and to see how the individuals can handle stress. So what would your recommendations be to increase that stress without having exercise? We want to make sure that we're progressing that stress. So uh, let's say, uh, let's say there's a punishment and someone talked back to your commander or something like that. Who knows? But uh, and then the whole group now has to do that same punishment um, from going from just that one normal training session that was already planned to something that is physically punishing, putting that those members and recruits at, to failure, um, it's gonna put more more risk on people that, let's say, have a uh, sickle cell trait, have, uh, are more novice at training. Um, 
So I would say stress-wise, I'm not sure if you're talking about physical stress or mental stress, but physically I would suggest like, and authors that I have referenced suggest that we need to make sure that we are progressing the exercises, um, progressing punishment. There is a punishment, making sure that you're not pushing people that are more at risk um, to full failure. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so I just have a question like based off of that conversation. Um, I just like, this is kind of more of an opinionated question. I don't really know a lot about military background. I don't have military background myself, but like you said, you said, you know, if it's someone talks back to a military like officer or something, they may get punished physically, like go do 100 push-ups or whatever. Do you think that that's something that a military person should not be doing? Or do you think that that's like unethical to do that? Or do you think that that's like, I mean, I don't know if you know anything about like, so I'm not or or yeah. do you know if that's like something that that just happens, whether or not you think it's ethical I, or not, it just happens. Yeah, I think I it's know. it's going to happen you know no matter about. what. It's just like I said in my my uh, last slide about prevention and care, um, making sure that that we aren't pushing people at risk to that full failure. So we're making sure that we are screening those recruits, we're screening those members for a certain trait, for different comorbidities, making sure that the athletes are, or um, recruits are well hydrated. Um, you're not working out in full, bright, 90 degree weather, you know? Like, um, right. so like that, I think those are precautionary steps that need to be taken into account. But as far as like putting those members in that physical stress and setting, I think it's necessary for their career choice. But we need to make sure that if something does happen or, um, the, the trainer or officer in charge doesn't know that one or, or two of the recruits have a certain comorbidity that puts them at risk of EIR, we need to make sure that that person in charge is accountable, held accountable if something does happen. Right. I have a couple of things. Candace, this was fabulous. I really enjoyed the pathophysiology flowchart. I think you hit it spot on. And clearly you've reviewed it over and over because you didn't even have to look at it. So well done, and I really loved how you off the cuff explained um, um, sliding filament theory. So, <laughs> so that was great. Thank you. Um, so I just had uh, two things for you, and it's not so much on the um, on the clinical side of what of what we're talking about here, but I do want to follow up on the screening process, and this is just more of the where we are in physiology when ethics and physiology hit smacked into each other. So there was a lot of grief early on uh, back in the 80s when athletes, athletes who were without um, one of an adjoining organ, so if someone was without one kidney, someone was at, without one eye, you were not allowed to be in sports because it was too risky that you were going to potentially hurt the other organ and you know you would then be blind or you know you would know, have kidneys or whatever the case may be. And I feel like we're here again with the screening process. Um, yes, people should be screened for things, but how do you feel about the discrimination that is within the screening? It's not just for for uh, for any of the sickling or the sickle cell, but sometimes you inherently have heart condition. Sometimes you inherently have. Uh, some pulmonary issue. So what are your thoughts on that and how do you think we should tackle that moving forward? I think it is unfair, but we have to put in the factor that these are people at risk of um, developing, you know, even more severe conditions and at risk of maybe uh, higher mortality. Um, so I think to a certain degree, it depends on depends on the type or the risk factors that we are talking about. So, um, and like what type of setting. So I would say like, uh, for example, with uh, EIR and uh, sickle cell treat, I think that's a big factor because um, in one of the papers, like I said, most of the mortality or if not the mortality risk factor or the people that died of EIR 
they had sickle cell trait. Um, so I think that's a big risk factor, and I think that's why NCAA has also uh, screened for that. Um, and I think because of that's such a risk factor in the type of setting that we are putting those athletes or those uh, people through, I think it's a big thing that to screen for that um, and make sure that those people aren't going to, you know, put themselves through this type of stress and potentially down the road die, for example. So um, it, it is a big thing to, to talk about and it's yeah. a difficult, uh, difficult topic to touch on, but sure. for that itself, uh, I can't talk, say much about any other like conditions, mm -hmm. but I think sickle cell trait is um, a big thing to take into account.